Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 808. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's June 27, 2023. All right, welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted episode. Pfft, I want to tell you the episode again. I just told you the episode. That's what happens when you get to our age, George. The, you, you just lose count of episodes and dates and times. But it is June 27th, which means it's your birthday. You're yes. 61. Happy birthday, George. Thank I, you. My, uh, one of our daughters, Laura, flew in last night. We picked her up with Orlando about mm -hmm. uh, 1 o'clock. And the exciting news in our life is that Laura has a new boyfriend. She broke up with the Tesla engineer after five years because uh -huh. she wanted to get married and start, you know, that mm -hmm. stage. She says she's 27. Her eggs are starting to go bad if she doesn't get married soon. Well, she broke up with him and she's met a new guy, Matt, whom she met at a Grateful Dead concert. <laughs> <laughs> George, 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 George. And, okay, he's not a fishmonger. He does have a good job. Uh -huh. And uh, she recorded a little video of them saying hi. And Matt is from Chicago. Chicago. Uh, you can tell he's the from Bears. Chicago. The Bears. So, so you know, th this is the Lord teaching me humility. This is the Lord you know, teaching me patience and grace. No, oh and that, my. Uh, no greater teachers of grace and mercy are my adult children mm -hmm. uh, and some of their decisions, which they do without the counsel or advice of their father. It's just like, well, uh, what, what should I expect? She lives just outside the Haight-Asbury district in uh, San Francisco, uh, and she wears tie-dye jeans and bell-bottoms, and is, she's into this hippy-dippy stuff. Oh, my. Okay. So, for those of you who want to wish George a happy birthday, go to the comment section. And you probably know this already as a viewer, but the coolest people on earth were born in June. The most awesome people you'll ever meet were born this month. George, let's move on to the news. Oh, just a quick update. We are somewhere outside of uh, Rapid City in the Black Hills uh, camping with Sasquatch. And uh, if you hear a lot of highway noise, we're next to the one road around here and every truck uses it. And then they're all going downhill. So they have their little engine brakes going. Rah, 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 rah. So what's the name? What's the name of your uh, Facebook page where you chronicle your travels? Uh, uh, yeah. Pretending we are retired. I have a link in the show notes. Um, I put videos up of our travels now. Uh, uh, trying to uh, let people uh, see what we're seeing and enjoy what we're enjoying and decide for themselves if they want to come out to the great west or anywhere else we travel all right so let's go here to have you been uh, now i've seen some of your videos of you uh finding snakes and alligators on your biking uh now you're <laughs> out here. in the in the, <laughs> in the mountains uh, have you been traced by bison or buffalo or or deer and antelope or wolves coyotes T tomorrow i'm gonna post a video called kevin versus the buffalo they call them bison out here and uh um, it's a, a great encounter between my car and a buffalo that has not made the news yet uh, because I've not posted the video. So it, 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 it'd be fun to watch. But yes, and you, you have can... Geico insurance. I wonder <laughs> yes. if you'll get a call from the lizard about that front end damage. <laughs> you know, say, a puncture? How do you have a puncture on your hood? I, yeah, don't worry about it. So uh, please watch the video on Pretending We Are Retired. Link in the show notes. Let's move on here to ACNA News. ACNA has a new canonical change. Uh, brought upon him by a some recent conflict within uh, the ACNA over some uh, legal issues. And we discussed that uh, in an episode two weeks ago. We didn't get a lot of feedback, which means we were probably right. <laughs> but let's give a little update, George. They, have a, they had a provincial council meeting, and uh, it seems uh, uh, they took the higher ground each side. On June 22nd, uh, Thursday, last week, uh, Archbishop Beach gave a speech to the Provincial Council where he recounted the dispute between his office and he and his advisors and the tribunal, 
uh, the ACNA. And the ACNA tribunal is the highest constitutional authority. It's an independent judicial board that uh, is the court of court of last recourse in the ACNA. And the dispute was over jurisdiction and uh, uh, recusal of uh, members of the court. And there was a series of publications put out and Archbishop Beach put out one uh, letter on the ACNA website, which we reprinted, uh, stating his position. And some people got really worried and anxious about this, but to use Archbishop Beach's words, it caused angst and concern. Well, Archbishop, Archbishop Beach said that the Council of Bishops has addressed this and has brought forward a resolution to reform the Constitution and canons to clarify the issues at dispute. And that he, Archbishop Beach, personally reached out to uh, the head of the tribunal, Julian Dobbs, and Clark Lowenfeld, another bishop member, saying he loves them as his brothers, and in no way does he question their their uh, commitment to the ACNA or anything. He just disagrees with a judicial interpretation they made. And he took the high road, as you said, and the instead of, he didn't trash the tribunal, he didn't do anything bad, he said, okay, we've got an impasse that the way the canons are written now, it's unclear as to the, as to the, their meaning. So let's fix the canons. And the canons were fixed. Uh, the bishops who were subject of recusal requests, um, they had signed the uh, uh, complaint against Bishop uh, R Stuart Ruck. They have stepped back because one of Ruck's, uh, Bishop Ruck's complaints was that they did not have firsthand knowledge. Correct. They were just yeah. signing this to have the bishop signatures. Mm -hmm. So their signatures are coming off and the new process uh, which Bishop Dunk, Archbishop Duncan uh, discussed at the provincial council that, sa council that same day, sort of clarifies how this works. It cleans up the ambig ambiguities. So uh, I don't think people are interested where they moved the semicolon and what sentence they took out or not. But rather, I think, to me, the real story here is how the process worked. Um, we can compare this to a second story in the Church of England, where when the Church of England had a dispute, the archbishop fired everybody. <laughs> fired everybody. Foley Beach did not fire everybody or say, okay, we're getting rid of the tribunal and starting over again. Rather, they sat down, they worked out where do we disagree, why do we disagree, what language do we need to make this clear so that it is not something that can be disputed, and let's vote on it as bishops, and then present it to the council, you know, for their ratification. So, in other words, perhaps this is, a, I think it's a question of leadership. And it also speaks to what, how Foley Beach was able to hold GAFCON together when you had uh, the Sudanese and the Kenyans ordaining women bishops when you weren't supposed to. Yeah, That could have caused everybody to go off in 20 different directions. Um, I think it's leadership where Foley Beach, his point prevailed, but the way in which he went about doing this makes everybody a winner. And that's a sign of a good leader. In point to that, the transparency. I'm mm -hmm. sure it was very uncomfortable for uh, Foley Beach to pen this letter and publish it to the whole world that says the ACNA has a problem right now. And mm -hmm. it's a big problem because a bishop... Uh, through legal counsel has pushed the nuclear option, the nuclear button, uh, to stop an investigation, and it doesn't look good. We need to fix this, and we're currently at consternation between the uh, tribunal and the head office at the ACNA, and he was very public about that. And I remember when that story hit Anglican Inc., and we posted it on Facebook, what's going on here? You know, this, this is, you know... Kevin, you called the ACNA a very mature organization. This doesn't look mature. You know, and I'm like, uh-oh. Uh <laughs> well, and you and I had an ep episode about this where we were uncomfortable because you're watching Brothers in Christ in conflict. And this was handled very well for the type of conflict it was. We actually, you and I actually disagreed off air mm -hmm. as to the importance of this. 
I felt it was uh, a low level issue because I just couldn't uh, because I just couldn't see Foley Beach being wrong in this. But you felt it really could lead to wider ramifications if they made the wrong choices and if they acted badly. You who's could, in charge? Broken up. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, who's in charge? You know, and at the end of the day, we we talked about this two weeks ago. Some of the canons in Title IV needed to be changed, and we knew this from day one. Now they've been changing the canons the entire twelve years they've existed. It's not like you know they they didn't know there's a problem. Uh, I think they they changed the canons majorly three or four times. Good, okay, and oh, we found another one. <laughs> Whoops on that. <laughs> And so they cross out the move the commas around, do what they need to do. So it, it's good to see an organization uh, that is handling this in a, a, from our perspective as outside viewers in a godly way, you mm -hmm. know. And it's good that this transparent letter from Foley Beach came out uh, two weeks before the provincial council. You know, that gave everybody time to say, "Whoa, we need to really look into this. It's not a side issue. Uh, it's important." Well, I think you, uh, I would, I would go so far as to say this shows the ACNA to uh, as as a creditable issue. Mm -hmm. It's to their credit because they have all organizations going to have disputes over jurisdictions and things like this. And to the ACNA's credit, its leadership took the high road, and in public worked out the difficulties. Mm -hmm. And so now everybody's on the same page. Everybody's happy, and they've. Uh, filled in some of the holes. That's a positive story to report. Yeah. Now, you remember uh, when Archbishop Duncan was going to retire, we said, who is going to fill those shoes? Well, Archbishop Foley Beach is going to be up for retirement soon. Who's going to fill his shoes? You know, th this type of action the last couple of days shows that he too is a, a major leader within the, uh, certainly ACNA and GAFCON. Who's going who's gonna to step into those shoes? Uh, from the current uh, uh, House of Bishops, College of Bishops, George. It's going to be interesting as we talk about that over the next coming months. Uh, number two story, Church of England has a safeguarding board. Nope, they don't. They all got fired. What's going on, George? This is the same story, different fact pattern, but same trajectory, except the Church of England's archbishops did it wrong. There's something called the Independent Safeguarding Board. Church of England has been going through a multi-year car crash train wreck of how they handle safeguarding, which mm -hmm. is abuse investigations of clergy and how senior clergy handle it. And the Archbishop's Council set up an independent safeguarding board. And this last week, they fired everybody on the board and shut it down, which basically said, it's not independent, and it's not a board. The conflict was over, uh, again, jurisdiction, and the Independent Safeguarding Board had three members. One who, oddly enough, was the head of the church's internal safeguarding. So you've got somebody with a leg both as the internal person and the chairman of the external body, which doesn't work under any logical sequence, from a woman named Meg Mon. Mm -hmm. And then two other people, a safe as victims advocate and uh, another person, a man and a woman. Well, these two people have been saying, look, we have been stonewalled and every step of the way, the church blob, the Church of England, the gray people at church house have just, they don't even give us computers when we go there to work. Uh, you know, the laptops or anything. I mean, we, you know, have a piece of paper to pencil. They probably hand them quill pens. Quill pens. Uh, and <laughs> they basically been complaining. <laughs> yeah. And there was uh, a meeting, and they were fired. Now the Archbishop's Council trotted out the Archbishop of. Well, before they were fired, the Deputy Bishop for Safeguarding, the Bishop of Birkenhead. Uh, I'm sorry, after they were fired, excuse me. After they were fired, the Bishop of Birkenhead, uh, Julia, or Juliet something, the Bishop of Birkenhead said, you know, I don't really trust the Church of England's processes either. So you've got senior people saying the, the, the system is not working. 
And so the Archbishop's Council responded and sent the Archbishop of York out onto TV to sort of poo-poo all of this and say, oh, well, we dissolved them because they leaked a press statement before we actually met and this and that. And the Archbishop of York came away embarrassed by the interview because he basically had a set of talking points he wouldn't deviate from, even when they were not the questions he was being asked. And he, he just came off as being very flat-footed, very arrogant. He used arrogance, he used sarcasm. It's the sort of behavior we saw at General Synod where he just was a horse's ass. And he comes across as, uh, he came across very badly that, no, you if you were abused in the Church of England, uh, the Archbishop of York is saying we had to burn down the village in order to save the village so we can plant a new village. Um, it just an utter fiasco. You can look onto Anglican Inc. and go through the minutiae, which is not particularly earth-shattering because it's just a question of bureaucratic power grabs. And William Nye, who's the uh, General Secretary of the Archbishop's Council and the Archbishops and the people at Church House, are not ceding an inch of their authority in any sphere of life in the Church. Meanwhile, the Church of England is dying. Every day it's dying. It's, it can come up with $100 million for reparations for slavery, but it can't pay its clergy a living wage. Um, it's just difficult. Just the management and the leadership is so incompetent. They're very incompetent. Uh, before I go into our next story, I just want to put up an article that appeared on uh, Daily Mail here and gives you the context of what we're going to talk about next. Uh, veteran biology professor who teaches scientific fact that sex is determined by chromosomes X and Y is fired after four students walk out of his re pre reproductive class accusing him of religious preaching. Okay, the, the world's gone crazy. It, it's a, the, here in the West, um, it, it, it's so woke, certainly in, in UK and England, and we finally come across a good news story where kind of uh, the pro-lifers are winning, but it's not here in America, which they did. We, we had, we overdid, we overcame and threw out Roe v. Wade, which is great. And uh, abortion is illegal in eight states and very hard in the rest to obtain. That was good. But generally, when you uh, appear before a court as a pro-lifer, your chances of success are low, except, George, in Germany. Oddly enough, uh, Germany had these laws, just like England does and some American jurisdictions have, of no praying, no protesting, no silent prayer around abortion clinics. Mm -hmm. Well, this was taken to court by German pro-life groups and a German administrative court threw out all of the country's anti-abortion, uh, all of the rules blocking speech and prayer around abortion clinics based on the right of free association and the right of free speech. So the Germans, of all people, are pushing in Europe free speech, free association, and you can now do vigils around abortion clinics as a legal right. In England, uh, we've had, uh, we've reported here on this show, and I think, Kevin, you talked to the woman uh, the, who was uh, at the center for one of the Arrested controversies. Church, yeah. Uh, about how she's jailed for silently praying near an abortion clinic. So England's gone one way into mind control, thought control, craziness, and Germany is going the opposite, which, uh, frankly, I was surprised. I, I, I would have thought Germany would be on the same wavelength as the English. Yeah, I think they're most, more socialist than America. Well, not nowadays. <laughs> on, on paper, Germany is more socialist than uh, the United States of America. And so I did not think this ruling would come from that country. But, you know, the, the courts are here to protect everybody. And sometimes we feel challenged because, uh, in general, Christians are not very well protected because of who they are and that built-in prejudice. And we've lost that benefit of the doubt. Um, that uh, uh, it's nice to see a story like came out of Germany. All right, on to story four. 
in, in case people weren't watching this week, uh, there was a mini rebellion where some mercenaries uh, employed by Putin turned on Putin and threatened to uh, invade Moscow and uh, come for Putin. And that cho- that that story was kind of dynamic because. Uh, these mercenaries are the most successful portion of the fighting army that Putin has. And w- w- wherever they fight, they seem to ha- have won the battles. And apparently last week, a couple of helicopters bombed, Putin's helicopters bombed these mercenaries. They got mad and said, we're coming for you. And everybody in Moscow wet their pants because they knew how bad this was going to be if they actually arrived. Uh Yet the Orthodox Church said, "Hey, we have an opinion on this too, George." Curl. Yeah, here. Yeah, the uh, this has not appeared yet in English any place that I'm aware of. Uh-huh. Uh, but Kirill, on the day of the coup breaking out, got onto the uh, Russian Orthodox's uh, website and sent a message to all churches denouncing uh, the uh, Wagner Group mercenaries who were revolting against uh, President Putin's rule uh, with very strong terms that these people are basically destroying Russia. They're hellbound. They're sinners. Uh, they These are the most evil of the evil for basically trying to divide Russia, which is doing God's work in the world. So the, the, uh, the coup attempt is now sort of fizzled, but for a few days there, if you watched MSNBC and company, you would have thought, you know, this is... Uh, you know, we're going to see Putin's head on a spike <laughs> at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, it, and then now we're seeing on Fox News, well, this was all a deep fake uh, to uh, smoke out any opponents of Putin's who've all been conveniently arrested and gone on holiday. Uh, they fled and their planes are not being allowed back in to Russia. Well, the Russian Orthodox Church has firmly tied its banner to the Putin cause. So be one of the first people and, if you will, one of the first public independent bodies, if you will, in Russia to stand up and say, we stand by our man. So it's I think it's an interesting story about how tightly uh, the uh, under Kirill and his archbishops, because if they didn't like it, they would they have a way of basically getting rid of people. Yeah, the Russian the Russian Church's elite are in are tied. They're going to go down with Putin if he goes down. I hate to put it in those terms. In fact, it was not Stalin, his his predecessor or no person who followed him, understood Photoshop before Photoshop was even available. People and pictures just disappeared. Oh well, so just the way it works. On to our next story uh, now. I'm a little embarrassed for the Episcopal Church when I talk about this story because it seems they're kind of behind the times on this topic. But Canadian Lutherans are to explore polygamy as a right within the church. Cool. Am I saying that wrong? Yes and no. Polyamory. Polyamory. See, polygamy is is one man, many women, one woman, many men. This is polyamory, where it's like it's the three people or more. And friends. They all, you know, two good boys, three girls. It's, it's sort of a, a blob relationship. Okay. Well, here's my, you know, my lack of knowledge. I I've not heard of that word until like a year ago. I just I'm not up on the times, and uh, the, the world has not got bad enough for me to hear that word. I now know the word, Dork, George. So let's talk about the Canadian Lutherans. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada, which is a full communion partner of the Anglican Church of Canada. Mm -hmm. So if the Canadians go down this road, the Anglicans will too. Um, Had a trial a year or two ago where a Lutheran pastor, a woman, was defrocked because she was in a polyamorous relationship. She, another guy, another woman, a goat, I don't know who it was. And... She was deposed for immoral conduct. Well, she appealed, and the Lutheran Church Court ruled that, well, the Book of Order, or the Lutheran Canadian uh, rules, do not specifically ban polyamory. Uh, so this doesn't. This is not the same thing as adultery, uh, because you're in a loving, just happens to be multi-party relationship. Um, so the 
synod of the Lutheran Church in Canada is going to take up. Should we not only recognize polyamory, but do we go further and bless this as a new sort of relationship among the younger generation? Now, credit the Episcopal Church. I've heard these musings out of Episcopal Divinity School in New York City for a while, and I've heard occasional pastors in the Northeast talk about how we should start supporting this. But uh, we've not gotten to the general convention stage. But, you know, friends, we always talk about what's the latest thing. You know, we are going to have gay blessings, and that's where it was all going to stop. Then it became gay marriage. And, well, and people say, oh, recognizing pedophilia, that'll be next. Um, as min and calling it minor attracted adults. I think we're going to still be a little while off on that one. But I think we'll have polyamory and polygamy because before then, because logically under law, uh, if it, the, the laws, moral laws and civil laws against polygamy make no sense now that you have same-sex marriage. Well, remember we had the Defense of Marriage Act here in America that existed for a couple of years. The biggest thing the liberals had tried to do in our country and in the West is change definitions. Mm -hmm. And I remember the Episcopal Church, they wanted to change the definitions in the prayer book of man and woman for the, the marriage ceremony. And um, I think if you can change those definitions between one man and one woman, and just make it between one person and one person, or make it between persons, you've achieved your goal of uh, uh, that, that P word you used. And it's just, you know, the biggest uh, uh, victories the liberals have made within the church is to change definite definitions. I I get the uh, Archbishop of Toronto's, uh, the Bishop of Toronto's uh, Twitter remarks, and mm -hmm. he said that he and his wife were going to go join the Anglicans pride float in the Toronto Pride Day Parade. Mm -hmm. And if I look on the news and the internet, I won't, you won't see it on TV, you see the Toronto Pride Day, there are these men naked exposing yeah. their genitalia wearing dog uniforms yeah or uh, i mean just you know vile public displays that the art the bishop of toronto is saying come join and we're supposed to celebrate pride well you know pride is one of the seven deadly sins um and it's just as you said we're in a bizarro world kevin where the church is celebrating something that we call a sin, it's just the word in general, and now that word pride has been transmogrified mm -hmm. into meaning, you know, support for all sort of deviant sexual behavior. Well, here, and this is the redefinition of pride. Okay, we've redefined pride, we've redefined hubris just to be pride. Mm -hmm. What you're seeing on display here in June is hubris. It's, you know, the, the, an extreme of pride where we take um, what is abnormal and we declare it normal. And if you don't believe it's normal, it's your problem. And we will make sure that our society understands it is normal. It will have legal access uh, in normal ways. And if you don't like that, you will be canceled or forgotten. It's, it's, we have mentioned this, but I just want to throw it in. There's a case in Mexico, of all places, mm -hmm. where a Mexican former congressman, and he's the head of the Mexican Family Association, he's a conservative Catholic, has been found guilty of violence against transgender people because he posted on Facebook, on Twitter or Facebook, uh, saying, you know, a man can't be a woman and a woman can't be a man just because they say so. In Mexico, Mexico City, this man has now been found guilty of violence. Um, it's like that, that. It's like the story you pulled up from the Daily Mail. A teacher fired for teaching, you know, Science, double right. X and X, yeah. Y. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not just Manhattan or Seattle or Toronto. This is happening in Mexico City. Uh, this is happening uh, around the world in various places. It's just a it's a wave that seems to be overwhelming us. Well, I say redefine, you know, that we redefine terms. We've undefined terms. Everything is becoming undefined. And, you know, it's not just redefining. And you, I don't, I don't see any way out of this other than the second coming of Christ, please. Or 
a, a dose of sanity somewhere in the world, some answering of prayers. Uh, moving on to the biggest story of the week, not according to Anglican.inc, but I think the biggest story of the entire week, maybe the month of June, no, probably the quarter, the whole quarter, is the Church of England has divested itself of fossil fuels, especially the Shell Corporation. Cricket, cricket, cricket. I mean... This story was all over the British press. You couldn't get away from it for a day or two. And we put out the press release from the Church of England media office when they said the church commissioner is going to sell their shell shares. And Kevin, I, I don't want to give away our inside information, but by a factor of 10, this was the least read story of the week. The Church of England had sold its shell shares because they want Shell out of the oil business. Well, Shell's in the oil business and they're not going to get out of the oil business. I'm sorry. And it's like, I don't, this is just such silly virtue signaling. Now, the Episcopal Church has rules where they don't own shares in Remington Firearms or Bally's Casino. Uh, or uh, R.J. Reynolds Tobacco. There are certain stocks that, and that you know the church over the years has said we don't invest in this, that, and the other. Well, do you know what it has? And it doesn't mean a darn thing as to share value because it's somebody the church dumps its shell shares, it drops a point or two, somebody snaps it up and has a quick uptake in the next day when it bounces back. Yeah. And if they think they can now. At least when they held shares, the Church of England's church commissioners and Archbishop's Council and all those people could influence by being at stockholder meetings. Now they're just a bunch of cranks outside and Shell probably's management is saying, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Well, it's interesting because when Justin Welby first started, he had a sermon denouncing payday loans and same day loans and uh somebody came up and tapped on the shoulder oh by the way the church of england has investments in that company <laughs> and so i think we're maybe they're cleaning house before they have more sermons or teachings about how bad fossil fuels are you know so, well you know if you get rid of fossil fuels we fall back into uh absolute poverty because uh i, I just saw something i don't know where so take it for what it's worth that if to replace all of the energy produced by fossil fuels, we would need solar panels covering every inch of land and dry land in the world. It's just it, it, not it possible with the current technology. No, it, it can't be done. We know that. But um, if I'm a, if I were a solar activist, you would never get to know the truth because I make money off letting you know to buy solar. Um, Kate, have you seen these giant windmills driving out west? Do they have? Oh yeah, in fact, it, in Iowa, they have all the rest stops have one blade of a windmill that has. They can't recycle them. Uh, a, this carbon fiber stuff is not really recyclable, so they use them here as statues and monuments. So I'm going to post a picture right here. Let me do the. Uh, Thirty-three, forty-three, uh, where there's just a windmill as part of a rest area. They don't have anywhere else to put it. So, hey, here's an ode to windmills. Um, do you want to know the solution, people? It's modern nuclear energy. You know, we don't have to have nuclear power plants anymore. They've completely redesigned how we get energy from the atom. And they're slowly winning hearts uh, out here in the West and uh, in parts of America and Europe. But that's the future is uh, the redevelopment of nuclear energy. Yeah, so we'll have to see how that plays out. Let's go here to our next story. I should have put this with the the uh, the Putin story, but uh, story number seven is Bartholomew denounces conservative evangelicals and Orthodox working together. How dare you talk to each other, George? Yes, uh, uh, Patriarch Bar uh, Arth Bartholomew, the patriarch of the the Orthodox Ecumenical Patriarch, based in Istanbul, mm -hmm. at the meeting of the Conference of European Churches in Estonia this past week, denounced what he sees as the growing uh, alliance of conservative evangelicals and Protestants in the United States and in Europe and the Russian Orthodox. People like Franklin Graham and various commentators on the right in the United States are, are supporting some of Russia's moral teachings on the family and homosexuality 
and moral issues. We're not talking about the war in the Ukraine, uh, but you know that the moral outlook of the Russian Orthodox Church is congr is congruent and is congenial to the moral outlook of a Western conservative evangelicals. And Bartholomew is saying you can't do that because you can't separate the Russian Orthodox Church from the war in Ukraine. So that if you join the Russian Orthodox Church in their fight against uh, Scientology or homosexuality or gay marriage, you are automatically siding up with them in their war against Ukraine. Now, I don't think evangelicals would buy that for one minute, but it's just, I think, fascinating to see. Uh, used to They used to have these things where Catholics and evangelicals coming together when people like Richard John Newhouse and Chuck Colson would get on the platform and for the first time, evangelicals and Catholics would talk on the same line. Well, we're now adding the Orthodox into that sort of united platform on moral issues, even though there are major differences on lots of other issues. Yeah. So I think it's a trend we're seeing. Oh, trends. That is an introduction to our next story. Now, as people know, I'm a full-time RVer, and I travel North America here during the summer. And if you go to certain places within this country, some of the history has been rewritten. Um, if you go to Thomas Jefferson's house uh, out in Virginia there, and you go through the displays, it is as woke as it gets. Uh, talking about such an evil hypocrite of a man, uh, served as a leader of this evil country, and he was the third, sixth president, whatever. And they just they, they denounce him completely in his own house as you're going through all the all the displays here out in the west where um the history with the native americans is messy uh it, it's not fun to know the history but you need to know it so we don't repeat it um they have not really rewritten the history they're being honest about it uh the relationship between uh the the people who moved out west in the uh 17 1800s and uh took land from the the Native Americans, uh, the treaties that were broken by our government, they're honest about it. You know, it's messy. This is where we are now. And uh, oof, it kind of sucks. It does. Every country has a mess in the history. Uh, America is not alone in that. So you and I got uh, contacted by one of our viewers who said, you know, if you go to the uh, website of St. Paul's Cathedral, they have totally gone woke, and they have Churchill phobia. They have an article denouncing Winston Churchill. Why would that matter at St. Paul's Cathedral, I wonder? Well, I think Churchill, I think he died in 64, mm -hmm. had one of the most impressive state funerals uh, of the 20th century. Yeah. Uh, and I, uh, the uh, so so probably some intern they're updating the website famous funerals and events from the life of the church st paul's cathedral in london and all this great history of it britain mm -hmm. and here's what happened and oh by the way winston churchill st paul's cathedral told us was a white nationalist and supremacist he was a racist in those words yes and this i think hit the telegraph and Churchill's family complained. And then one of the adults at St. Paul's said, oh, what are you kids doing down in the basement playing with the website? Um, but, and, it was, and it's quickly been updated saying that Churchill, I think, opposed uh, decolonization or opposed independence for India. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, uh, it's been smothered over. The, the, the rewriting of history uh, is just everywhere. Yeah, no, it's everywhere to the point where we're judging the past in the lens of the, the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we know what's right and wrong regarding uh, civil rights. Now we know what's right and wrong regarding many different issues, inc including colonization. We can't apply our lens now to judge the people of the past. We can apply our lens now to understand the people of the past so we do not repeat those uh, same problems. But it does no good to look at George Washington and call him a racist because he owned slaves because that just was the understanding back then. You know, it was 
or Thomas Jefferson for that matter. Uh, it, you know, yes, some of the things they did were hypocritical. Uh, well, I don't see anybody complaining about some of the hypocrites in office right now. You know, uh, we're, we're shining a lens where we should be shining it upon ourselves if we're looking for hypocrites. So it, it's hard to watch this rewriting in history. Um, I love history. And um, I, I'm hyper aware when I go into a, a, a place, a monument, or a national park, or a, a famous place, and I'm reading the history of it, I'm hypersensitive to, oh, that's not right. They just rewrote that. You know, <laughs> so, you know, it is what it is, and hopefully we can tell our children the truth. And I guess you do that by collecting the current history books now and making sure they don't get changed, George. Moving on to the news out there. Last story. This is... Uh, oh, Michigan. There's a bishop of East slash West Michigan. He's made the news because his divorce is being very public because his sons have taken to social media. And I, I back this up as a journalist and an observer of the last 15 years. I can watch Fox News, CNN, and any of the major news sources, USA Today, all around the world, and I have to literally look and reread a story to, to find out if it's a real story. I almost have to do the investigation myself for stories I see printed in major publications because so much news now is made up or so one-sided and, and so biased that it's hard to tell where the truth or where the facts lie. And here's a story where I'm not sure because we live in the... the, the uh, the age of social media where you can throw a whole bunch of accusations on Facebook or Twitter and you are leaving it up to the, an individual to defend himself publicly on social media. Now, they very well may be all true. This guy could be a scumbag. He's right, right now he's an alleged scumbag. So, George, what is the story for this bishop? Prince Singh is his name. Mm -hmm. He's the provisional bishop of Eastern and Western Michigan. He's the retired bishop of Rochester, New York. Mm -hmm. uh, Eastern Michigan is a tiny diocese that uh, uh, can't afford a bishop. And Western Michigan's bishop, Wayne Hoagland, retired on, after a infidelity adultery scandal. And so the two dioceses got together and hired Prince Singh to sort of be their caretaker bishop following the, the scandals, the scandal of, of Wayne Hoagland. Well, Prince Singh got divorced. Uh, he originally is from India, he and his wife, and they had an arranged marriage. And after 25 odd years living in the United States, they went their different ways. Uh, his children sided with the mother and began publishing statements on Facebook that their father was violent, abusive, a horrible human being. And Prince Singh, after these allegations were put out by his, and the, these came out after his father announced that he had met somebody new and was going to get remarried. So Prince Singh was the bishop, was publicly humiliated by his sons. And so Bishop Singh called the presiding bishop and said, look, please institute a Title IV investigation proceedings to see if I have been guilty of misconduct so I can either be cleared or let go. So I have experience of human life after all these years and, and being a pastor pastor and a priest tells me not to believe a lot of these allegations uh, that I hear in nasty divorces. Well, or at least take sides early on. Uh, you know, let both sides speak. And I think that's what we lost in the, the tenor here in America is that there's two or more sides to every story. Mm -hmm. Here in America, in the last hundred years, um, especially with our, our liberal media, there's one side of the story. Uh, I'm watching, you know, what used to, even in the 70s was a two-sided story on abortion. Here it's uh, extremely left-leaning articles about uh, how the rights of women have been taken away, how we've gone back to the dark ages, um, you know, all that is, and, well, where's the balance? Where is the perspective of a pro-life person in this article? You know, and so I, I, I want to, at this time, you know, I said he may be a scumbag, allegedly, who knows, but I want to allow the, the Anglican scripture 
uh, viewer to know that it's impossible to read what's a real article and what's not. You know, and and I salute Bishop Singh for basically uh, doing the very hard thing, which is not hitting. He could have hit back just as hard as he was hit by his family, and sometimes you see that where the su- husband and the wife rubbish each other, and the children are proxies in the fight. But he's asked uh, an independent third party basically to assess the validity of the invest of the accusations against him. So he'll either sta- he'll stand and fall on the truth, and this is something I think the church will in- investigate honestly. There's no, uh, I don't envision any ulterior motives here from anybody other than finding out the truth. And if he is guilty as charged by his sons, he will have to step down. But if he's not, he can continue in office and the allegations will be shown not to be true. Mm -hmm. All right. Florida Standing Committee gives an update on the Holt confirmation process. Uh, We forgot to talk about this in our show notes. It just occurred to me somebody asked about this in Facebook. Uh, Listen, are we just saying, you know, we're pushing the pages away and uh, we're just going to wait for uh, Holton to be denied? Or is is this something that's going to... Are we really going through the process? Um, I'm going to speculate now because I do not have access to the the numbers. Mm -hmm. Uh, Charlie Holt uh, was Central Florida uh, whose bishop was just ordained uh, last uh, week last Saturday um, got his consents very quickly the diocese of Florida in their letter dated uh, yesterday or today announced that they're waiting to hear from people so they haven't been turned down yet but they've not collected the consents so what does that mean it means it's really either very slow coming in or people are having doubts and questions. And my sense is that this is going to go the wrong way because if the longer it takes, because there's a set time limit and we're approaching the end of the time limit and a non-answer is the same as a no answer. And so some dioceses who don't really want to take a side on this issue will just sort of sit it out. So I think we may see... uh, it's not looking good for Charlie Holt. But again, I have no access to the numbers, but just based, Central Florida's new bishop is pr- more conservative than Charlie Holt. Mm-hmm. Yet he had record approval. Yeah. Strange. Uh, one more story we forgot to cover, George. ACNA attendance strongly rebounds, which is good one, news. I mean, you know, uh, th- th- like every other uh, church denomination uh, during COVID, poof. You know, we I know it, we can't just count the people on our live stream and say that's our attendance. And they saw a reflection of a loss of uh, 20, 30 percent. Now they announced at the the uh, latest meeting of the, the bishops uh, that oop, we're up 30 percent. That's pretty good. It is. The overall nationally, the attendance has come back uh, pretty much where it was. However, I think it's uneven. I think there are parts of the church that are doing very, very well and parts that are rather stagnant. And it's unfortunately geographically bounded. In other words, as your experience in New England, Kevin, and in the Northwest and the uh, Midwest, uh, places where there's demographic decline, we talked about last week about the Episcopal Church in Michigan, I'm sorry, Wisconsin, people moving out of the countryside to the cities. Those areas, you know, the Great Lakes area, whatnot, there's demographic com- decline, and it's much harder to grow a church there than it is in the suburbs of uh, Atlanta or San Diego. Sure. Yeah. So the ACNA is doing very well in some places, holding its own on others, and in other spots, it's seeing the same challenges that every other denomination is facing in rural America and rust bucket America and in pagan America. Agreed. I guess they're up to a thousand congregations, which is awesome. All right, George, that's it for today's 
this week's episode. I'm going to record an episode this week with uh, Matt Kennedy from Stand Firm. Uh, you have a funeral to attend on Friday, so we're going to have a, a, a quick fill-in guest for the week. Other than that, enjoy your, your week. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 808 of Anglican Unscripted.